Good evening. My name's Alex. I'm a grateful uh, recovering sexaholic, believer in Jesus Christ, struggle with sexual integrity and anger issues. I want to remind everybody, uh, it's not like we do this every week, but uh, just what groups are meeting tonight, because those are the places to find healing, and those are the places to find experience, strength, and hope. Those are the places where real change happens. Uh, What I say up here is probably not going to change your life a whole heck of a lot, but going to these groups and being in these rooms absolutely has the power and ability to do that. So, we have women and men's chemical dependency, women's and men's codependency, men's sexual integrity, hurt and loss, family and friends, compulsion education, and our student group for teenagers, 13 to 18 years old. Uh, Let's pray. God, you are so good. We thank you for another beautiful day, for the breath in our lungs, for waking us up this morning, for the opportunity to come together in friendship, in fellowship, to focus on you and the message that you would have for us tonight. There are other places we could be. For one reason or another, we have chosen to be here together in community, in this house of worship, with other people who are struggling to make it day in and day out. And we're here because in this place we can rely on your hope, your mercy, your grace, and your wisdom. I ask that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you and that you prepare our hearts and our minds to hear a message you would have for us, your people, this evening. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Um, so, I don't know if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we were in a sermon series, and then last week there was this thing called Holy Thursday, and now we're still in that sermon series, but I'm not talking about it. So, Mark's going to finish it next week. We're going to talk tonight about staying sober even when it hurts. Um, so, how are y'all doing? That was weak. How are y'all doing? Okay. See, that's, that's like the church response, right? And, and Bob sitting over here, and he's always going to say, better than I deserve. Every single time you see him and say hello to him. Um, but there's this thing that we do culturally in society where when I ask somebody, how are you doing? Like, I'm probably not going to get a woo, but I'm going to get a fine, and then we're going to go our separate ways. You know, I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm fine. And then... But that's not typically actually how we're doing. Sometimes it is. I mean, like 80% of what we do day in and day out is very generic, it's very the same, it's very mundane. We go through the motions. Um, Rarely do I find myself in a situation where I say to somebody, how are you doing? And I get more of an answer. You know what I'm talking about? There are people that you know in your life who when you ask them how they're doing, you know you're going to get the story. And it's a real story, and it's it's the truth. Um, If you were asking me at some point in the last four to six months how how I'm doing, and I was going to answer honestly, um, then I'd have to say that I've been living through a season of depression, that things have not been great in my life. That's part of the reason I think God put this topic on my heart, um, is because I am living in sobriety even when it hurts. And that's just not something that I'm always honest with people about. I spend a lot of time going, you know, things are okay, or I'm here. I'm here is never a response that everything is going well. It's just not. Um, You know, just something to think about as, as we consider this moving forward. Uh, that how are you doing doesn't have to be a generic question with a generic answer. It can actually be something that, that is meaningful. And Paul, if we can't kill that clicking, we might switch over to a handheld. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I want to talk tonight about how we stay sober when it hurts. But I want to talk first about different kinds of hurt. Um, 
And I want to talk first about when sobriety hurts. And I understand that, that might not make sense right off the bat and out of the gate. One second. All right. Sobriety, uh, as I understand it, or, and I think as most of us understand it, is supposed to be this solution to pain and suffering. Um, sobriety itself, though, has the ability to cause pain. Now, when I say that, cause pain, I'm talking about hurt, not harm. Um, sobriety, in and of itself, is an action. There are action steps that you and I take every single day in order to get and remain sober. So there are things that I do to stay sober that can hurt myself or that can hurt other people. Well, what, what does that mean? Things such as um, being rigorously honest in my day-to-day -day life. There are things that I don't want to share with anyone. There are things that I'm embarrassed by. There are things that cause me shame. There are things that... Um, I feel guilty about having done in my past. There are things I feel guilty about having done today. And I, I don't want to share that with somebody. And it hurts me on some level to put myself out there. But in the long run, it's, it's, it's not going to stay that way. There are, you know, just doing things I don't want to do. I think there are a lot of things that we do in recovery that are counterintuitive. They're, because they're not things that we've been doing for the entire rest of our life. And they're not things that we're used to doing. So stepping into them and stepping into these new actions and stepping into the unknown is ridiculously uncomfortable. And then in terms of hurting others, again, hurting, not harming. We're not causing um, long-standing emotional trauma. I can hamper the expectations of others particularly if I have set those expectations through the way that I have behaved as a result of my addiction for a number of years. And it, because of those expectations, when I come in and I do something like set boundaries, boundaries that did not exist at all before, then I'm doing that so that I can stay sober, but I'm hurting another person in the process. So what... What do I need to do in those situations when sobriety hurts? And then what do I do just when life hurts in general? I think there are at both external and internal circumstances when life itself hurts. Uh, it, you know, in terms of external circumstances, we deal with pain and, and difficulty of life, traumatic experiences, issues at work, relationship problems, the news, all of it. I don't know how many people I have talked to in the last couple of years who just don't watch the news at all anymore because it's, it's just something that has the power and the ability to bring us down. There, there might be an occasional feel-good story here or there, but most of what gets reported um, is all the horrible things that happen in the world. It doesn't mean we should be uninformed, but those things cause us strife and they cause us pain and they cause us to hurt. And then I have, you know, internal struggles, things like anxiety and depression and worry, guilt, even things like compassion fatigue uh, for those of us who just care too much about other people and people who have helping careers and people who are just that person for others. Because uh, some of us, regardless of our career and what we do, are going to be the person that others in our life come to when they have struggles and they have pain and they want someone to talk to because they know that we're an okay person to talk to. So how do I stay sober when it hurts? When, when I'm hurting like crazy due to the loss of a loved one or a job loss or depression or divorce or anything else that causes me pain, how do I stay sober? How do I find the strength to survive pain in sobriety? And that, that question is significant and hugely important because living in active addiction and living with uh, my compulsion, that's how I solve pain. That's what I do. So when I feel that pain and I'm getting sober or trying to stay sober, how do I do something other than slip back into that thing that I've always turned 
to? How do I, how do I make it different? First thing I have to do is establish rhythms of recovery. And I have to establish rhythms of recovery in the good times. Right? So if I'm not doing recovery when everything is going well, when everything works, if I'm not doing that before everything goes sideways, am I going to survive the pain and the hurt of life when it hits me? My chances aren't as good if I don't already have established rhythms of recovery. So what are those rhythms? Uh, I have to key into the wisdom of the rooms, the experience, the strength, and the hope of others. Uh, whether that's my sponsor or speakers or testimonies or just somebody else in a meeting. Um, it could be that even somebody with 10, 20, 30 years of recovery sitting in a regular meeting, listening to the newcomer talk about where they are and going, I remember that. I really don't want to be there again. I think oftentimes for old timers, it's the new person who reminds us what it was like, who allows us to see into the past of ourselves. Um, I have to eliminate the idea that I am terminally unique, that no one else has ever experienced this before, that no one else has ever been through this before, that there is no hope and there is no solution for me. Uh, program phrase, meetings, meetings, meetings. Meeting makers make it, and meeting makers don't make it just because they attend meetings. Meeting makers make it because they participate in meetings, because they do the work of the program, whether that be actually physically working steps one through 12, whether that just be showing up, right? It's okay to step zero for a while. Getting in the door is better than sitting outside. But if you're sitting outside in the actual meeting, it's better than sitting in your car or staying at home. You gotta get there one way or another. I have to maintain open lines of communication because community is the solution, right? I've said it a hundred times from here before, isolation is the number one contributing factor to addiction. And if that's true, then community is the solution. And if that community is already established, then I have something to fall back on. How hard is it to form community when everything in your life is going wrong? How easy is it, alternatively, to reach out to the existing community that you already have when you're used to the rhythm of making phone calls to a sponsor, reaching out to accountability partners? In the small stuff, if I'm doing that in the small stuff, it would be second nature for me to do that when something big comes along and everything goes sideways. Second thing to do, realize that pain is a necessary part of life. There's a saying in the rooms, kind of 50-50 on it, um, that relapse is part of recovery. I think I'm 100% on this, that pain, pain is necessary. Life is a series of hills and valleys. We have ups and downs. Sometimes we call it a roller coaster. If we eliminate pain in our lives, we have to realize and understand that we're also eliminating joy in our lives and this whole other spectrum of emotions. If there's no pain, there's no joy, and anything in between, because then life just becomes this redundant, mundane, thing with no feeling and no emotions. And I think for a lot of us, for myself, definitely that was part of acting out, that was part of active addiction, was not feeling any emotions at all, ever, good, bad, or otherwise. Um, being exuberantly happy and on a mountaintop was a great reason to act out. Having absolutely nothing to do and being bored was a great reason to act out. Being in the pits of hell was a great reason to act out. Anything was a great reason to act out. I didn't need much. <laughs> Philip Yancey has this quote from the book, Where is God When It Hurts? He says that C.S. Lewis introduced the phrase, pain, the megaphone of God. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts 
in our pains, he said. It is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. What pain does for us is acts as an indicator. It's like a check engine light in your car. When the check engine light comes on in your car, at least the first time, you're gonna go out to AutoZone or someplace, have them run a diagnostic scan on it, let them tell you what's wrong. At some point, as your car gets older and you become more aware of how it operates, you're either gonna unplug that light or just let it go. We do that with pain. When we become comfortable with pain, we tape over the light or we just let it go. But it's a way that, that God gets our attention and goes, you know what? Something's not working here. And it's my job to key into that and figure out how to take my next step forward. And as we come to realize that life has difficulties, that pain is necessary, we're that much closer to finding peace. Pain then becomes just another part of the process. The big book says, even when we have tried hard and failed, we may chalk that up as one of the greatest credits of all. Because it's better, you know, to try and fail than to not try at all. Under these conditions, the pains of failure are converted into assets. Out of them, we receive the stimulation we need to go forward. Someone who knew what he was talking about once remarked that pain was the touchstone of all spiritual progress. The entire journey of recovery is a journey of spiritual progress. We forget that life is supposed to hurt. Of course life hurts. Of course recovery hurts. They're supposed to. But living with pain is counterintuitive because culture teaches us that we should feel good all the time. Look at the commercials that show on TV, assuming anyone actually watches TV that has commercials. Look at our television shows and our movies and the pleasure that we're supposed to derive from those. That's part of the reason why so many of us landed here in the first place is because we were trying to feel good all the time. Trying to chase that wonderful feeling that we may have had of euphoria or what we thought was euphoria one time long ago. Our addictions and compulsive behaviors are a means of trying to dull or eliminate pain. But we get so caught up trying to get rid of the pain that it becomes impossible to see anything else. So living in pain, pain becomes not the touchstone of spiritual progress, it becomes this all-encompassing thing. I just exist in pain. And all I wanna do is step out of it without realizing that sometimes it's necessary for me to sit with that. And as I sit with that, I must recognize the impermanence of pain. Pain's only temporary. It's not gonna last forever. This too will pass. It doesn't mean that all pain is just gonna go away. The loss of a child or another close relationship, it never leaves, but it changes. The current form of pain becomes something else. Part of the problem is that we want microwave solutions for slow cooker problems right? There, that's, it's a societal thing. It's something that's been ingrained in us. But if I take a step back, I realize that the problem in the first place didn't come on overnight. And that while I want something that's expedient and I want it now, like J.G. Wentworth, I got to wait. It's not my money. I, I still want it now. And, and the last thing that we have to do is stop trying to make it make sense. This is a form of control. This is a form, way that I try to take power out of God's hands, right? So like personally, one of the things that I try to do is I try to logic everything out, right? I, I try to understand um, everything. And I want to be understood 
in everything. The problem with that is that there aren't any openings in the Trinity. Like, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it's complete. And I'm trying to put myself into one of those places. I have to realize that I don't have to have all the answers. No matter how much I want all the answers, it's not my place to have all the answers, to know everything, to be God. And I don't have to have someone to blame, myself or another person or God or the enemy. I wanna have someone to blame. I mean, I really want to have someone to blame. I want to take this onus and put it on something out there in the ether, anything. Because at least then it will make some sense. There, there's a semblance that goes, okay, that's the cause, what's the solution? But what I'm doing in all of those, in trying to logic it out, in, in trying to understand, in trying to have the answers, in trying to place blame, what I'm not doing is trusting God. And uh, I think we've all heard step three before, but it says we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God. And that's God as I am capable of understanding God today. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm working at Costco these days. I work in maintenance. That means primarily what I do are like floors and bathrooms and trash. It's honest work, but it's not where I want to be long-term. They have internal positions open, so I keep applying for positions. And one of the things they ask is about like, going above and beyond or giving 110%. Y'all, I can't give 110%. I don't think any of you can either. 100% um, is the most I know I am capable of giving. We can talk about going above and beyond. We can talk about giving 110%. But what I can promise to my employer, to my wife, to my friends, to the people I interact with, is that I'm going to do the best I can today. And the best I can today may be different from the best I could yesterday or the best I can tomorrow. My tank might not be as full. I tried to go on a, a bike ride today and I didn't last 45 minutes because I hadn't had enough to eat and I hadn't had enough to drink and it was hot out there and I was miserable and I put the bike back on the car and I went home because I couldn't give today the same thing I was capable of giving two days ago when the situation and the circumstances were different. But I can give the best that I can give today. And so for people who struggle with this, this step, this decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God. First of all, what I have to do here is I have to make a decision, and I have to make this decision on a daily basis, that today I'm going to turn my life and my will over to God. As I understand God today, and the way I understand God changes, and it grows, and it transforms based on what I learn from others, what I read, how I interact with God. I mean, let's face it, there, there are probably a lot of us who didn't interact with God at all before we started working these 12 steps, at least not on a level that was actually meant a whole heck of a lot. So let's go back over those, uh, those four things that we need to do. Establish rhythms of recovery. Realize that pain is necessary. Recognize the impermanence of pain and stop trying to make it make sense. That's what I have to do on a regular basis to stay sober even when it hurts. I would hope that the same thing would work for almost anyone else in this room. I can't tell you it will. I can tell you it works for me. And I can tell you that I've been living in some pretty dark times lately, and that I haven't shared that with a whole lot of people. Um, but I'm comfortable sharing that here, because I know there are people in this room who are going through the same thing right now, and I know there are people in this room who understand, and I know that the people in this room accept that and accept me as I am today. 
There's this passage um, from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi where he's just kind of wrapping things up. Um, it's what, like, if you or I were writing a letter or if we were writing a paper, this would be, like, the conclusion. Paul has said what he's going to say, and he's like, all right, to end with, this. And we're going to pick up uh, at, like, verse 6 of Philippians chapter 4. And Paul says to, says to the church, now Paul's one of the, the church planters, um, the pri one of the primary two church planters that we read about in the New Testament. He's the guy who went to the different cities and was like, all right, we're going to have different little house churches here, and you're going to have some issues, and you're going to let me know what those issues are, and then I'm going to write and respond to those issues. And that's what Paul has been doing. He says here, starting in verse 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Then the God of peace will be with you. Let's stay there. <clears throat> he starts off by saying, don't worry. Pray about everything. Don't pray about the hard stuff when you find yourself in a foxhole. They say there are no atheists in a foxhole for a reason. It's because everything is hitting the fan and people are going to reach out to anything they can. But again, this is part of the rhythm of recovery. Praying about everything. And he says, if we pray about everything and we tell God what we need and we thank God for everything God has done, we will experience a peace that exceeds anything we can understand. I don't know about you. That sounds awesome. Like, just unimaginably awesome. And his peace will guard our hearts and guard our minds as we live in Jesus. And the God of peace will be with me, will be with you. That, that part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, will live inside of us and grant us that peace that passes all understanding. Going on, picking up in verse 9, the second part, he says, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. This is established community. Paul wasn't with the people at Philippi all the time. He was traveling from church to church. He spent time in prison. Um, he actually probably wrote this letter from prison And he's in community with these people. And he knows that they're concerned for him. And he knows that he can rely on them. And he didn't have to, but he knew that if he needed to, they would be there for him. You got people like that? We need people like that. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I just said Paul is writing this from prison. Paul is sitting in a jail cell. Some of us have been there. He's going, you know what? In this jail cell where I don't get a whole lot, they take care of me enough to survive, things are okay. In that space, I am content because I have a peace that surpasses all understanding because of my relationship with God. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I can have all that the world has to offer. Or I can be living on crumbs and it's okay. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. Community, 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 community. 
Paul is saying here what we have already said. Rely fully on God and community. It's hard to make a mistake when doing that. And when I do make a mistake, if I'm relying on God and I'm relying on my community that I have already established, then I have people who will hold me up, who will lift me up, and who will help me up when I find myself in the pit. That's what I need to stay sober when it hurts. I don't know if you have a community. I hope you do. Because it's community that helps us fling wide the gates of hell. It's community, even if that's a one-on-one -on -one communion with Jesus Christ as Lord, that is community. That trinity has the ability to carry us through but it's being in communion with others in that fellowship that provide the support that I need to carry on. Right? When I come to this place and when I look out and I see all of you, I know that there are people that I can call at two o'clock in the morning who are going to answer the phone, who are going to understand what I'm going through, who are going to give me words of wisdom that I need to carry on. It's because of this place, it's because of this community, it's because of the 12 steps that led me and continue to lead us deeper and deeper into relationship with God that I'm still standing here at all. Now, I... I haven't been in a season of suicidal ideation in the last four to six months, but I've been there. And I've been there in sobriety in the last five years. And it's being able to share that with people in my home group, with people in the rooms that allows me to physically still be here in this place. It's putting that out there and people going, yeah, I've been there. I get that, I understand. You're not alone, and this is how we move forward together. My wife says this all the time, mostly to her patients, but she has a husband and two kids, so she's patient with us. She says life is all about choices. And tonight, this is another opportunity to make a choice. It's an opportunity to make a decision to Turn everything over to God as you understand God. It's an opportunity to walk away from the crutch of addiction or compulsive behavior that, that you have been leaning on or that you have fallen back on. We all have that chance tonight. I'm gonna pray and this altar will be open. I've got white chips. If you want this to be the first day of the rest of your life, this is the time and this is the opportunity to do that. Would you pray with me? God, you laid it all out. You gave up your life. You hung on a cross, even though you didn't have to. You asked your father to take it all away, and then you accepted your fate. There's not enough gratitude in the world to make up for that. You are so good and you have the ability to make us good and clean and whole again. Thank you for the opportunity to enter into relationship with you, to rely on that relationship in the darkest of hours. I ask that <clears throat> if anyone here feels that tap on their shoulder of the Spirit leading them forward. That they take this opportunity to welcome Jesus into their life, that they take this opportunity to turn over their addiction, that they take this opportunity to become a new creation that you intend for them to be. 
thank you so much for all that you have done, for all that you have given us, for all that you are about to do in this place and with us as we go out from here. Your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen.